Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us today. I'm Corey Pierce, Marketing Director at Churn Zero, and I'd like to welcome you to our webinar titled, How to Streamline Onboarding to Reduce Churn. Before we get started, I'd like to remind you that we are recording this session, and a link to the recording will be available 24 hours after this webinar. Throughout the presentation, you are welcome to submit your questions via the question and answer box, and our staff will answer them as we go. We will also address as many questions as we can during the Q&A portion of this webinar. Now, I'm pleased to introduce to you our presenter today, Bora Lee. Bora is the Customer Success Operations Team Lead here at Churn Zero, and she's passionate about helping customers succeed by crafting big picture strategies executed through automated, streamlined processes that put the right data in front of the right customer at exactly the right time. She works hand in hand with customers to create meaningful long-term relationships, which is all starts with onboarding and why we asked her to speak on this topic today. And with that, I will turn it over to you, Bora. Perfect. Uh, thank you so much for that introduction. Can everybody hear me? I just want to make sure as we have uh, some people still filtering in that you can see my screen. So it should look like uh, a title page that says how to streamline onboarding to reduce churn and that you can clear me. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much for all of those responses. So today what we're going to do is we're actually going to be going through talking about how successful onboarding impacts customer retention. We'll talk through five signs that indicate you might need to revamp that. So um, some of the different pieces that might indicate that we need to be looking at our onboarding process again. And then I'll give you some practicals. So three mistakes to avoid and three strategies to imitate when you're implementing changes to your existing onboarding process. Now that doesn't mean that if you don't have an onboarding process yet, or it's not solidified that you can't get information from this. I think um, all of it is useful across the board for all types of onboarding. So let's start here with how successful onboarding impacts customer retention. And really before we can get into the practical part of this, I wanna make sure that we're all on the same page around what onboarding is and what churn is to you, because that can mean a number of different things to a number of different people. So what is onboarding? Let's think about onboarding as the process that users are taken through when they use a product or a service for the first time. So really this is gonna be the first time us as customer success engages with our customer. What's important to note is that this is not the first time that the customer is engaging with your company. So that's a kind of a clear distinction that sometimes we just think, oh, this is the customer's first experience with us. With us as customer success, yes, but with us as a company, probably not. Now, I see a lot of different types of onboarding. So we have internal onboarding versus external onboarding. We see employee onboarding. I see end user onboarding. So where a business sells to another business, but really the user is the end user of the product. So the consumer, um, I see customer onboarding. So I've named these in my own jargon. So they could be different and you know uh, across different spaces or different industries the last piece there is just the customer onboarding so we as as a business sell to another business and maybe the stakeholders there or the users there are their internal users so if you're thinking about churn zero it's churn zero sells to your business right we work with you and then you work with your cs team to make sure that they're using um churn zero to make you know make their customers successful now, the principles we're talking about today um, are not just unique to a specific type of onboarding. You should be able to apply this across all types of onboarding. Some other types of onboarding that are not on here that I do want to mention can be onboarding for different segments of our customer base. So low, mid, and high tier. They could be different comms cadences, right? So low touch, no touch, or high touch. So those are some other things that we want to think about. Now, when we're talking about onboarding as the key to effective customer retention, I wanna throw out some pretty big numbers. So the first number is that um, it is five to 25 times more expensive to get a new customer than it is to keep one. 
right? So think about the cost of acquiring a new customer versus a customer who's already bought, who could be happy, but has chosen to leave, right? If we think about some numbers in that aspect, that's a pretty big uh, financial reason for us to pay attention to onboarding. But it's vital for a, a couple of other reasons to ensure that the customer feels like they made the right choice, to make sure that the customer is engaged and aware of what they need to do to make this a, su a success. And really, um, it's critical. The onboarding process is important at getting them to the first value, right? Are they finding value in the product itself? Now, on the other hand of onboarding, and not the complete opposite, but very related, is going to be churn. So what is churn? Churn happens when a customer cancels. It could be for voluntary reasons, it could be involuntary, we could be talking about logo churn, we could be talking about revenue churn. Um, what is the reason that customers churn? To me, um, you know, there's some clear reasons and there's some unclear reasons. So some things that you may have experienced with your own customers is that customers churn because the value is not clear, they churn because the value is too delayed, so they don't feel the value right away. Uh, maybe they haven't gotten resolution or some feedback or engagement on issues. Maybe there hasn't been any actual personal engagement. They don't have a CSM um, or an individual to reach out to. So it really happens when the value that the product is offering has declined. Now, based off of all of that type of information, it all leads me to, and those the, those folks who know me um, know that I always preach this, is numbers. Measuring success or measuring failure is key to improving anything. You do not know where you have or can go, where you have grown in order to, to really get um, the benefit of improving, right? So if we have a place that we know we're start, please make sure that you have a measurement to start off of. Uh, no measurement can ever be bad. What's really bad is when we don't have a thing to measure by and just guess that we're succeeding or failing. Um, in terms of customer churn, it can be measured in a lot of ways. Some ways I know um, are kind of standard are the number of customers lost. For example, the dollar value of business lost, the percentage of your recurring monthly or annual revenue lost. Um, so just think about it in the sense that if you were to increase your retention of your customers by 5%, then you could potentially create a 25% increase of overall revenue growth. So those are big numbers. If we talk about $1, $5, you know, $10, $100,000. So there is a very real reason for us to be paying attention to onboarding as a method to improve customer retention here. Now that I've got your attention, I'd love to go ahead and kick off with a, a, our first poll. Uh, and really what I wanna know is how many of you know what your churn rate is today? And this is not um, you know, a good or um, you know, a way to say you're doing really well, you're really doing poorly. It's more about, are you tracking this today? Um, are you tracking it, but you don't know what it is off the top of your head or the fact that it's not being tracked at all? And so I know a lot of people that say, yeah, we're tracking it, but uh, we actually don't look at this at all. So uh, my point being there is that we want to not only track it, but we also want to regularly review that metric because that is really what um, is telling us that our customers are, are leaving or choosing to um, you know, cancel their subscription or they're choosing to stay. So it looks like we have a good number, about 60% say, yes, we're tracking this today. Another 30% say we are tracking this regularly, um, but that it's not being reviewed. And we say, we see about 10% uh, where it's not being tracked right now. So that's a pretty, I think, normal breakout there. I think I would hope for you all, if there's a takeaway, that we want to start to learn what our churn rate is. Um, because think about a 1% or a 0.3% decrease in that and what that impact could be on your retention, uh, on your growth in the longer term. So now, the second part of this is kind of looking at five signs you may need um, that indicate that you need to revamp your onboarding process. 
And I like to start this always with a, what should this look like? And then we can get into what things we should be looking at in the longer run. Now I have here kind of five things that are all very, very related. There could be more things, right? Everybody has a different type of uh, process. Everybody has a different type of business. But I think we can all agree that a good onboarding process should provide a clear roadmap. So our customers, or you all as customers, think about your experience. Um, you want to know where you're going. If you get me into a car and you say, all right, let's go. I'm like, where are we going? I'm not going to tell you. Okay, well, how will I know when we're there? Or how do I know if I need to stop for food? Um, what happens about gas? What am I doing? It's just confusion and it's very, very chaotic and it's anxious for me, right? Um, how many of our, our participants here today have experienced something like that? I probably think uh, everybody has experienced that over their, over their lifetime, right? So we wanna make sure that we're providing a very clear roadmap into where the customers are headed and what the outcome of that is. The second part is to establish a realistic expectation. So we all know that you know when a customer comes in, especially if they are, are fresh and hot off of our, our sales team and they've been transitioned to us, maybe it was a one, two, three week process, maybe it was a year long process, maybe it was a one day process. They come to us with expectations of what we can do for, for them. And I think it's really important to establish a realistic expectation, right? Highlight the value upfront, reset expectations, let your customer know that this is, you know, we're in this together, it's a partnership, and here is what you should be expecting. Um, this is where you give your customer the first small, painless, call to action, right? Let's set up a call for next week, yes. Let's do this, yes. We get the small yeses here so that when we get to the larger value yeses at renewal time, we have all of the small wins along the way and the customer has been involved and engaged and has confirmed that those are good, those are accomplishments for them. Have specific objectives and timelines. So the first three all really correlate. If you don't, you know, if you don't, uh, if you haven't caught my trend here, right? It's about being clear. It's about being open. It's about setting expectations. So when we're talking about specific objectives and timelines, um, really, I mean, let's not overwhelm the customer. Let's be prepared as individuals to talk to our customer. Let's make sure that it's personalized. Let's make sure that our customer understands and we understand the customer, first of all, um, and that they understand um, you know, where they should be heading again. Um, and, and really go for those valuable wins. You can't go for those wins, however, without knowing what the specific objectives are, right? Without knowing what the customer values. Focusing on um, your expertise, I I put this in, and I think it's important because I don't think all customers are meant to be with your product. As much as I hate to say that, and that might be um, you know something that that nobody here wants to hear, all your customers inevitably will not be a 100% perfect fit. Um, so it's okay not to win all of our customers. What we can do is we can control the message that goes to our customer. You are the experts. You know your customers, you know your product, and the combination of the two should make you the expert in your product, in your service. And what that means is that you should be able to advise, guide, and you know, and share your experiences on how they can be the most successful given the information you know about about them which leads me into my last piece right make sure you gather information before you talk to the customer um, you know listen to a demo go to their website take advantage of your sales team know what's happening with the customer so that the whole experience for your customer is is personalized so the worst thing, and I've seen this happen before, is when I when you go to a customer and you're like, here are the best ways you can implement. 
And the customer is like, but that is not how our business is structured at all. So you've given them a subscription kind of model and they've come in and they're like, nope, we're pay as you go. So that should be something that we should know up front. We should know prior to speaking with them. Or if we don't have that information or we don't have the access to information like that, those are the things that we should fully ask um, around you know, around what our customers' needs are, you know, what kind of model they are. You know your product, so you know the questions that you need to know as a team, as a company, to be able to successfully onboard your customers. Now that I've talked through kind of a good onboarding process, there are definitely some signs that I've seen, uh, that our team has seen, which would probably indicate that you want to have another look at your onboarding process. The first part of that is that you can't explain it in a minute. And I'm being, you know, I'm being pretty specific here with the time, but the point is that your onboarding process is clear and concise, and it's not overly complicated or confusing. If you can't explain it in a way that makes sense in one minute, how are you going to ever uh, ask your customers to be able to follow through on all the different touch points, uh, all the different kind of lines of reasoning around your onboarding? Uh, think about the fact that we live in a world today that is so uh, immediate gratification, right? I go to my phone, I get a text, I get a notification, I get an email. Everything is happening at rapid speed. I might only have a minute to get my customer's attention and that's the one minute I need in order to get all the information to my customer and have them actually understand or get that into their heads. So if it gets too complicated, um, really you're not, you're not doing yourself a favor, right? Your, your customer is not gonna understand it. It's gonna be hard to explain. Um, so that might be something to think about. Uh, I like to challenge you know, I like to challenge my customers. I like to challenge my team and ask them, like, if you had an elevator pitch, 30 seconds, you're in an elevator, you get in, you have to explain your onboarding process, and you've got till the 10th floor. What do you say? And see what your team says. Uh, see if they are aligned in what that onboarding process looks like. And if they're not aligned, think of it as a learning opportunity. Well, what do we think as a team is important? Uh, what do we think as a team makes sense? And what should we be sharing, right? What should we be sharing with our customers? Because your teams are the ones who are explaining the onboarding process day in and day out, right? So if they're not aligned in that, how can we expect that the expectations that we're setting for our customers are standard at all? The second piece there is that it's exactly the same for every customer. Um, <laughs> this is one of my favorite ones because it's I experience this all the time. I talk with Verizon or I call, you know, my cable company, I call my telephone company and I say, "Okay, this is the issue." And they go through this whole spiel. Some of it is useful, right? Some of it I know is just the process to get the particular information. But I can tell that they're going through a standard script. And I can't get them off that script because everything has to go exactly the same for every single customer uh, because that's what they've been given as the process and they have to follow it. Not necessarily um, you know, of their own accord, right? That might just be their job. But your customers are not the same, right? You, your customers are not the same. Your team is not the same. The way they approach your customers is not the same. If you treat every single customer as exactly the same, you're probably missing a little bit uh, about their needs, right? We're probably experiencing that that um, there's some value or some some pieces of information that we could have had be quick wins at the at the outset uh, be lost in the mix altogether, and we just lose them. Now there are different instances, right? So this is saying that regardless of multiple levels of customers, right? regardless of tiers of customers, regardless of size of customers, regardless of other things, we're just saying this is the process and you have to follow it from start to finish, right? Uh, I don't think a lot of folks do this now, uh, but it might be the same within the same tier of customer, right? All of my small, medium businesses, if I if I treated them exactly the, the same from start to finish, regardless of um, what they're asking for, regardless of their value. Of course, it's obvious that our customers 
um, may not be as happy across the board. You don't have an internal transition process. So this is a big one, I think, um, that I see misalignment um, for a lot of the times. So we, if we think about customer success versus account management, if we think about being proactive versus being reactive, um, how can we expect our customers to trust in our processes, to correctly onboard them, to manage them effectively if we internally cannot manage that? Meaning that, again, your customer has been talking to a salesperson or some sort of individual in order to get signed up uh, for the most part, I should say, um, for, for days weeks, months, how long is that sales cycle? So they have a familiarity with the company, right? Your company. Um, so when they see they've had a great experience with sales and then all of a sudden they get over to actually implementing the product, but nothing has been has been shared about them. There's been no transition process and that particular CSM knows nothing about them. How are they gonna feel? Right. So I think uh, alignment between sales uh, and CSM and having a process around that internal transition. What are the things that we should know about the customer? Should we know that they're using certain, you know, vendors? Should we know that they're using certain technology tools? Um, you know, what are the things that are important to the executive sponsors, to the uh, to the decision makers, to the stakeholders? Those are the kind of things that we'll probably start to want to think through in documenting, and I, I want to emphasize documenting that information and making sure that that transition happens, whether that's an email, whether that is a, uh, a phone call with you know the internal stakeholders, right, the CSM and the sales rep, whether that's an in-person meeting every week to make sure that that happens seamlessly. Then we have here that you have not changed your onboarding process at all in the last year. And I know that this is this is something um, where I kind of point to the three P's. So we have processes, we have people, and we have products. At any point in time, I would expect each one of those to evolve. Uh, they might evolve independently, <laughs> they might evolve um, individually, they might simultaneously all evolve at the same time, but things are always changing. And I understand that it's not easy to document a process and then continue to update it, but if you haven't changed it at all in the last year, this is the time that you should be reviewing um, your processes. Uh, I might recommend maybe just reviewing it every quarter um, and, and making small changes to the process every quarter so it's not so overwhelming. But really, what we want to think about is an adaptive process. So if we change this here, how is that going to impact the outcome here? If we see something is not working on one end, um, how do we ensure that in the future it gets adjusted? And some are bigger changes that might take time. Some are smaller changes that might uh, be things that we can do today. But this all leads back um, to an additional point, which is hiring. Do we want to choose only those people who are going to work in a certain you know, manner or do a certain thing? So follow procedure to the bat. Do we want more curious um, or intelligent, like emotionally intelligent and curious individuals that might be open to adapting? And there is a time and place and there are companies that you know, following the procedure and doing exactly what's laid out in the process is exactly what that company needs. And there are companies where you want that person to be a little bit more curious, where you want to have them be a little bit more agile uh, and adaptive in nature, right? So you know your company's best. Think through that. But hiring, I think, is a, a really good place to start thinking about some of that. How flexible do you want your team to be? And it might be half and half, right? You need those folks who do follow that process and you need um, those folks that are a little bit more adaptive. So I'm digressing a little bit here, but it's just an interesting thought, right? Um, to start at the very, very beginning of that whole process with your team, who is in that core piece. 
the last piece of the signs here, so we've gone through uh, a number of different signs. So we're starting with, you can't explain your process in one minute. Then we touched on that it's exactly the same process for every customer, that you don't have an internal process, that you haven't changed the process. And finally, I'm talking about the numbers. It's all down to the numbers here, right? We're not tracking any KPIs around onboarding. So I, I ask you, you know, think about it to yourself. Um, do you know what your onboarding time frame is? On average, how long does it take your customers to onboard? Is that a data-driven number? Is that a gut-feeling number? Is that a we think maybe it's this for some of our customers number? Right? I challenge you to think about that because, again, um, this is your early warning sign. If you know you have that number, then you can measure whether or not your process is working, and that can help you to identify leading indicators of churn that can be used in other aspects, right? To help you to, um, in the midlife of the customer lifecycle after onboarding, help you to indicate if, if customers are happy or not. So think midlife cycle is support tickets, escalations, um, NPS, actual usage, change to business structure. So lots of different things that you could start to think about. But measurement, numbers, data-driven objectives there are really key, right? And that's the driver to be able to, um, you know, get, get what you need as a CS team uh, from the company, right? So we need to prove in a, in a manner that makes sense and that it's driven by data and not just our gut feel to be able to identify that. So this leads me to my second poll. Um, do you track how long it takes to onboard a customer? So I know um, some companies do this um, to the T. I know some companies haven't done that. Um, I would challenge you to know not only your mean, right? Um, your average number of days or months it takes to onboard a customer. This could be different for different segments as well, right? So your smaller businesses might take a shorter amount of time. If you have a no touch um, you know, customer, segment then you might not take any time to onboard but do you know what your high touch segment onboarding time takes um, do you know what it takes for those people who are your ideal customer fit to get through the process and if you have ideal customer fits that exactly fit the needs of um, you know excuse me where you solve the needs of that customer perfectly um, do those customers go through in the ideal time frame as opposed to the average time frame and how quickly are we getting our customers through that process um, this is where i also and i'll touch on it later i like to talk about something called like minimum viable success so if our customers were to come to us today uh, and they were to get through the onboarding process what would they need to have achieved during that onboarding process for them to walk out of that um, saying, yes, I have achieved value, right? We know our product, um, it, our products are designed in a way that solve problems. That's why customers come to us. So we should be starting to think through, okay, if we know that our customers come for us to solve an issue, we can track how long it normally takes us to get them through that process successfully. That's the key word, right? We want to get them through the process successfully. Successfully being that minimum viable, you know, value. So what do we have to do at minimum for the customer to see that success? So um, it looks like we have a good number of, a uh, pretty even split here, 42% where we're tracking it, 26 where we're tracking it, but we uh, don't regularly review the metric, and then 32 that are not tracking it at all. So I would encourage you to just think about it um, within your own process. Think about onboarding uh, your employees, right? How, uh, how quickly can you onboard them? Probably the, the number of days it takes to onboard your CSMs to give them the appropriate product knowledge um, could be similar to, you know, your customers being onboarded uh, with a little bit of leeway there, of course. 
Um, so just think about that. And I think that the metrics there will help you to drive and identify different bottlenecks in your process as well. Maybe it's a particular part of that process that takes longer. Uh, maybe we're waiting on customer issues or customer information. How can we make that a little bit smoother for them? Is that a product thing? Can we can we utilize the product to do that? Is that a people thing? Can we explain or set expectations in a certain way? Is that a process thing? Can we make the process easier or more clear so that that obstacle is lessened or even disappears? So now that we've talked through all of the kind of theoretical points, um, I thought it would be useful for you all to have some actual takeaway, so notes um, where you can avoid maybe making some mistakes, and then some strategies to start to think about changing your onboarding process. So I'll start with kind of the things that we may want to avoid or step away from. Each of these is broken down into kind of some kind of things you can think about, and then also what I call a churn hero tip. Right, so tips that you should be able to use practically, hopefully starting today after our call, um, to be able to, to improve your onboarding process or start to look at different places within um, your process to, to revitalize it. So the first thing here is avoid thinking that you can control everything. Uh, I'm one of these people where I like to control everything and I think you know I'm a perfectionist and I like to to make sure that everything works perfectly um, recently uh, we've been going through this mantra of control what you can control right so in this sense there are some things like where customers churn for reasons completely out of your control the customer went bankrupt well there is nothing I can do about that <laughs> right unless I give them money they're they're out of business the company maybe was acquired and there were the acquired company um, and they don't have a choice about the tools that they use um, a customer who bought expecting one thing but that that your product doesn't even offer or maybe it's not aligned to your product at all so really the tip here is avoid thinking that you can control everything and let's focus our intention. Let's focus what we are trying to spend our time on to what is within that reach of control, right? So if we know, so let me flip this here. So if we know that a customer has been acquired, maybe there are steps that we can take on our end to get to a better outcome. So how do we connect with the acquiring company's executive sponsors? Is there a process that we can put into place that shares some best practices or that puts us on site in front of those individuals who are the stakeholders? Maybe we have some sway there, right? The second part of avoiding um, uh, what we look at is kind of flying blind. Um, I like to think about this in a real life customer situation where my boss comes to me and says, hey, how many of your customers, how many of your customers are in trouble? And I'm like, mm, have you ever had that moment when you're like, uh, they're asking me a question I should know the answer to, but I don't, we don't expect you to know that information, of course, off the top of your head, but that information should be somewhere, right? So we want to make sure that we have visibility into where our customers are. If you're responsible for a book of business as an individual CSM, I want to know where my customers are generally at any given point in time, because if I don't, that means that if they're struggling, I cannot help them. If they're doing wonderfully, I cannot congratulate them. So some questions to ask yourself are, you know, do you know how many of your customers are onboarding? And I get, if you're a high velocity team um, and managing a high velocity team, you may have thousands and thousands. So maybe this is a percentage, right? Maybe it's not the specific number. If you're a lower velocity team, uh, maybe you have some of those numbers more handy. Um, if you do, do you know who are on track behind or stuck? Um, is your team doing anything about those customers that are behind or stuck? Do we have any strategies in place in your onboarding process that identify processes to manage escalations or processes to um, talk through an executive sponsor if the delay is on the customer's end? Right. So in terms of visibility, uh, this kind of relates to where the customer is in the onboarding journey or how long that takes. I would start with what you expect of your average customer. If we don't have this number, let's start somewhere. 
we can make a rough guess and go based off of that and then work your way towards the ideal customer timeline and what i mean in terms of that is we all have that perfect um, perfect fit customer that they do everything right they come in they're prepared they're invested um, maybe if dev team is required their dev team is everything aligns and they get through this process in what you would expect to be the ideal time frame take that as your goal right and then let's let's start with the the realistic portion of it because not all of our customers are going to be like that but the more we trend towards that ideal we know we're improving our processes right so some interesting things i've seen done around this is are things like cohort reports so knowing what your minimum viable success is for onboarding and building cohort reports around that how 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 frequently and how quickly are we getting our customers to this point hopefully over time we're getting better right and the closer customers to our most recent customers are getting um, the best level of that process as possible right we don't want our customers from five years ago to be like yes your onboarding process was amazing and it got us through and then your newer customers who are going through exactly the same process being like this was not good right so something has to give there in terms of that process We'll also talk through uh, one last thing to avoid, and that it's, if it ain't broke, don't fix it, <laughs> right? So everybody gets into a point where we're kind of tunnel visioned. So we say, okay, well, we are stuck here. Um, it's working right now. We're at capacity or we're underwater and we're just gonna do what we need to do. Now, there are those times that yes, you just need to put your head down, do what you need to do and come out on the other side, 100%. But don't forget to come out on the other side and review and tweak and look. Because again, going back to the three Ps, right? Process, people, product, something is always going to be changing. And we don't want to let uh, those changes just kind of run away from you. That just creates bare work um, in the longer term. So some things to ask, right? Where are the bottlenecks? Where are our customers getting stuck? Um, where is my team spending their time? Uh, I would challenge you also here to, to do a survey, um, you know, break it down. Here is a pie chart. Where do you spend your time? Um, you know, give yourself the entire week. Where are you spending the majority of your time? If that time is spent in emails or admin, which I've done the survey a number of different times, and it tends to be towards that. What can we do to fix that? Are there ways we can template information? Are there ways we can standardize it so it's a little bit easier? Are there ways we can automate some of those processes that so that it's easier or alleviates a little bit of the time? Can we talk through calendar blocking? So not being so attracted to the instant gratification, the email box comes in. We are CS people by nature. We want to just resolve things for our customers, right? We want the quick feeling of being able to be like, yes, I, I solved that for that customer today. Check that off of my list. Um, how can we help our team? Uh, in this case, I love to use either new customers or new employees and be very frank like hey i would love your perspective on this we want to make this experience as good for you as possible um in particular new employees or new hires are the best because they can go through your onboarding process right we want them to learn your product uh you should they should be experts at your product at the end of this do they see success at, with your product at the end of this process and if they don't then they can tell you exactly where they felt the holes were, right? Where the gaps were. Um, they can help you to document some of that information if it's not documented. So there are so many things that you can do just, just with your regular hiring, um, with your regular new hires, new users of the account, new customers. Customers, of course, are not gonna help you to document, so don't put that on them. But you know, be honest with them. Hey, we would love your feedback on you know on the process you know where you feel you know you could you want to be a little bit more supported you know what kinds of resources you were looking for if you didn't find them you don't have to take all of that into consideration right but it would be great to get that feedback so that you could do something about it if it made sense now on to the other half of it right so if these are things that we are avoiding here are some things to consider define what success really looks like. 
So please don't tell me that onboarding is they got through the 90 days. Okay. Um, that is just getting through the 90 days. That is the bare minimum, if that. So outline what your customer needs to experience during that onboarding to be successful. If I intend for them to reduce churn, what are the steps that I have to take my team through in order for them to be able to do that? Well, I need to make sure that our customers are happy at the end of onboarding. I need to ensure that their customers are engaged and motivated using the product during the mid life cycle. I need to make sure there's opportunities for my customers to expand. Uh, if necessary, I need to be able to have checkpoints if they've gone off track. So what what does that success look like for you? Um, and it could be a smaller chunk. It doesn't have to be the whole customer life cycle, right? So we could start with what does success look like um, after implementation? So what should the customer be feeling? You know, what are the things that we should have accomplished? Um, and then kind of move on from there. Start with that bare minimum and start simple. It doesn't have to be every single, um, you know, full utilization of every single part of your product, right? It could start with, hey, uh, we have customers that come to us that, you know, that just need one place to look at all of this information. Awesome. Let's start with that. So success looks like being able to get everything from different locations into a single place. Cool, right? So there's different things. And again, this is not just for one customer, right? We might have segmentations or buckets of our customers that would need to experience that. The second consideration that we might wanna have is collecting data, the numbers, right? You have, I'm sure, tons and tons of information at your fingertips. It's how to use that information to impact your process. So use the data that you've collected to make sure you identify, yes, uh, those aha moments, those great moments that really change uh, the customer's experience with you, that change um, you know, what they see as, as value and really up the ante there. So think about things like maybe NPS, maybe a, you know, some type of survey. You might actually get um, referrals or reviews, right? Actual feedback from the customer. You might want to ask, of course, for that feedback as well if you're not doing that. Uh, you might go through the process with your internal team and say, hey, you know, where are your customers struggling? Um, where are they not? What are they asking for? Right? So collecting data um, and starting with a measurement and knowing that you can identify critical spots in your process. Um, knowing that you can identify spots where you know every single customer struggles in that process and making those pieces easier. The last piece I'm going to talk about is feedback. So I've talked a lot about taking measurements, identifying obstacles, you know, evolving and adapting. A big part of that is actually creating a feedback loop whether that's internally, whether that's externally, um, making sure that you know what works for customers, making sure that you know what doesn't work for customers, and having a place to see that information. So don't just take feedback, right? Don't say like, we love feedback, we want your feedback, awesome, you've told me X, Y, and Z, and then just kind of put it at the back part of your mind and forget about it. You know, you're like, oh yeah, I've gotten a lot of information about customers that kind of want to do that. Okay, well, tell me what customers, because we're just releasing this, this new feature enhancement. Uh, I don't really know. So document, right? Make sure you have that information documented because maybe it's not something you do now, but maybe it's something you do in the future. Uh, I'm sure that that also can help your product team <laughs> to prioritize maybe. Maybe we can put enough, you know, screaming hands on there, squeaky wheels on there um, that we can drive up the, the priority list or the roadmap uh, with regards to your product if it's something that, that makes sense to expand on. Um, internally, right, if we're talking about um, employee onboarding or employee and customer onboarding together. Internal feedback is really good too. Hey, all of my customers are getting stuck here. Something is wrong here. Um, we're running into this here. All of my customers that, I, that have churned are leaving because of X, Y, and Z. All of that is feedback and all of that is valid. Now, can you act on all of that? 
Probably not, right? Let's be honest. Um, there's a lot of different types of feedback there. But certainly, um, you want to create that feedback loop. So we're going to, uh, we're close to the end here, and I want to make sure that we have some time for questions. But the last piece here is just a key takeaway. So if you walk away with absolutely nothing, I would love to tell you that onboarding is a dynamic process. Take a step back every quarter, every month, every year, measure, evaluate how things are going. And don't just let it be a one-time thing. Uh, don't make it be so overwhelming that uh, you can never do it again, right? Or it's, it's only something that you can do when you have all of the time in the world to invest in. Incorporate those changes to the process product people to ensure that your customers are set up for success and that your team is set up for success, right? So I hope that everybody walks away today with a couple of things um, to take away. Uh, some practical things, some maybe thought-based things around their processes uh, that can help them within their own businesses. Perfect. So I think we have a couple of different questions um, on that. So I'll actually go to the question panel and see if we have any, um, any questions and I'll let Corey kind of moderate that and I can answer there. Awesome. Thank you for that great presentation, Bora. And yes, we've had a number of questions that have come in. And so let's dig right in. Um, we've had a couple of different people wanting a recap of um, what type of data is important to gather during the onboarding process. Mm -hmm. What data or KPI should they be tracking? So I think that this is a very um, broad question, right? And one where I can't help but be vague. I would say that, um, you know, with each process, with each onboarding, there's a number of different things that you definitely want to be tracking. So if you are doing some type of onboarding, you definitely want to track when the customer has started onboarding and when they have successfully completed, right? So the time it takes to get a customer through that onboarding process. If you have specific milestones or things that need to be completed within that journey, um, whether that's a customer-based milestone or an internal milestone, you may want to track the time it takes to get to that point. Um, I have, in my experience, I've seen customers track um, specific goals. So that's a little bit harder to do depending on what your, you know, what industry and what business you're in. Um, but I've, I've had customers track time to time to initial goal. Um, I've had customers track um, you know, the, the total time spent. So, you know, if you have a product where they should be in your application a certain amount of time or should be doing a certain number of things, you may want to track that type of usage. You might also want to think about things on the other side. So if a customer is struggling, what are the metrics we need to review or try to identify in our process so that we can help them before they get to the point where they're so frustrated that they wanna walk away. So some of those things might be, okay, we know that this milestone takes on average X number of days to get to. Um, if they take more than 15 days, we've seen empirically that um, you know, they're so frustrated they walk away. Okay, well, at the 12 day mark, let's, you know, let's create a process that says if they're at 12 days, um, they should have been done in 10, but it's before 15. At that 12 day mark, let's make sure that everybody has a task for any customer who has hit this point to reach out to the executive sponsor and make sure that we're pulling them back on track and you know getting a strategic meeting in place to ensure that we meet their deadlines, for example. So I think lots of things there. If you have a specific industry or business you're talking about, I could probably um, get a little bit more specific, but I think that that probably answers that question. Yeah, those are all really great recommendations. Um, our next question is, what would your recommendation be to increase your chances of engaging as many stakeholders as possible during and after the onboarding process? Okay, so <laughs> there's a couple of things there. Do you engage them during the onboarding process? Um, for what reasons would you engage them outside? So I would say at any high value point, success, any low value point, those are all 
great places to bring in, you know, executive sponsors or additional stakeholders. Now, it would depend on what the stakeholder is interested in. Um, and I would outline that expectation from the very start. Hey, uh, stake we require all stakeholders to be on this initial kickoff call because we want to get to know you and because we will be communicating your successes. Um, and, you know, if we need to pull you in to get us back on track to make sure that you realize value, we're going to do that. Uh, we'll do this in a strategic manner so you're not called in for every tactical or technical thing. Um, but is that OK with you? You know, I love to use the, is that okay with you? Because then you go back and you're like, hey, um, congratulations, you had this great success. Everybody loves to hear about successes, right? So that's an easy one. And a lot of people will follow up on that. But when you go into maybe struggling a little bit, that could be the point where you reach out and you say, um, listen, I know we agreed to, to talk about this, so I'm reaching out to you, um, you know, just to let you know that this is happening. We're handling this, but it could use your input. And what that does is put, uh, investment in the hands of the stakeholders so that when you come up to renewal or when you come up to a big decision point where they are the ones making the decision to continue to use your product or not, you have that uh, relationship, right? It's not just a one-off that you you go to an, you know some type of business review every year where you just rope them into this thing, but it's it's a valued relationship where you are providing important information, relevant information about, you know, about their standing and about what they've been able to gain. Awesome, I think, yeah, those are great um, ways to go about involving stakeholders in the process. Our next question is, how do you recommend avoiding customer overload in the onboarding process? Um, so by customer overload, what I'm assuming we mean is customer overload on your CSM. Um, I think, I don't they, know. I think uh, they, uh, there's also another question, so I'm tying these in together, okay. <laughs> um, of just overload of information on the customer during the uh, process. Got it. Um, so trying not to overwhelm the customer, right? Yes. Um, and I think that happens, right? Especially with uh, some of our onboardings that can be a lot more technical, that can involve many, many um, different players, maybe can go months or even years. Um, I think the biggest part of that is just to say, you know, here is the process. Let me give you kind of the very, very high level overview, but then just break it down. Like, don't worry about any of this other stuff. What we're going to focus on is this piece, which is this month, this next 30 days. Um, and then, you know, let's talk about the different ways we can make sure that we hit those specific deadlines or those specific objectives or timelines. So let me give you an example. If the if the onboarding was going to take, for example, uh, 90, 90 days, 180 days, so six months before they could even see value, what would I want to what would I want to parse that down to? Right. So I might say, okay, the technical implementation I know was only going to take the first month. The rest of it is really configuring and then training and then trying to get every single user on. So let's let's par it down. Let's say, okay, we have all of this stuff that's six months worth, but we're actually only going to focus on this piece, right? This one piece, which is technical implementation. And guess what? All we need to do today is to book our next call and to make sure that we have your technical point of contact on that call. And the next call, we can handle the next, et cetera. Now that's very, very much simplifying it uh, because I understand that there are a lot more working pieces, but there's always an opportunity there to parse what could be 180 days worth of tasks, activities, and people that need to be involved down to a much more manageable chunk, right? How many people have their calendars fully booked out for the next 30 days? Um, probably a lot more than you think. How many have them booked out for the next you know, 90 days, probably not as many. So let's let's focus on what's in front of us at, at a given point in time so that that customer is not walking away thinking like, oh my God, I'm never going to be able to do this. So I'm never going to start. Got it. Yep. Um, so the next question we have is, do you have any recommendations for ensuring a smooth handoff from the onboarding stage to a more maintenance related stage? I guess the question there is, uh, if the handoff is between, for example, implementation specialist and a CSM, uh, that might be one thing. 
it could be that you're just transitioning them from talking to them at every single point you know uh, of the day all the way to like hey now you're live with a product you've got to go ahead and kind of just use it on a day-to-day -day basis i think the two are are pretty similar right um, again you want to outline expectations uh, if you are handing off internally you certainly want to document um, you want to have the person who is handing off be very clear about some of the things that the customer is looking for um, you know when we do these types of things I like to provide a couple of quick wins so that the new person can jump in and be like hey I figured this out for you here are a couple two places where you can get very very quick value and I can help you set that up as well as maybe a longer term objective so as a team as a company we are laying the customer out to be successful and we are putting into the hands of the next person um, the keys to to be successful immediately uh, while they kind of get their bearings under them Awesome. Yeah, I think those are some good things to think about in terms of transitions. Our next question, let me see. Um, sorry, I lost it. <laughs> uh, well, how would you suggest to handle or motivate unresponsive customers to go through the onboarding process? This is, this is one of my favorite ones, uh, mostly because uh, just think about um, your customers are people. We are people, customers are people. If they're not being responsive, there's probably something that is burning on the other end. I doubt that any customer comes to us and says, okay, let me spend all of this money on this product and let's do nothing. Let's just waste our money. So I think the first thing to think about, and I have to remind myself of this all of the time, is that customers are people too. I am a person too. Um, and and think about different mediums. I think the first thing I think of when a customer is not responsive is, have I provided anything of value, right? Am I just saying, hey, I'm just checking in, cool, can you give me a call? I probably wouldn't respond to that. Um, versus, hi, you know, hi, Joe, I wanted to let you know that you know, we talked about this a couple of weeks ago, um, and I know that we have this brand new feature coming out. I think you can utilize it in this way. Here are a couple of things you can do. I'm happy to jump on a call and actually get that set up for you, right? Two completely different ways of reaching out to a customer that can result in very different things. Now, the other thing is, if you are only reaching out to them via email, which happens, I think, pretty frequently because it's the easiest way to get to a customer, you might want to think about a different medium of contacting, right? Pick up the phone. I don't know how many people prefer that, but, you know, at least it gets their attention. They'll probably listen to the voicemail if that's what you leave. Uh, reached out. Reach out through some social media platform. If, you know, if you are active on LinkedIn, if they're active on LinkedIn and you see them posting, you know, comment on that. Uh, if you have an in-app tool, if you have a chat tool of some sort that allows for communication with your customer, uh, you might reach out through that. And I think uh, we get so bogged down into, well, I sent five emails and they never responded to me. Well, how many emails do you get a day? And when everything is burning on fire, you know, how many of those do you get to or how many get accidentally deleted or uh, put into archive, right? So there's different things that I think we can do. Uh, but I think those are two really easy ways. Provide value, right? And then use a different medium. Awesome. Love those ideas. Um, we have another question that came in is, what is your opinion on measuring NPS after onboarding? Is that a good time to survey the customer? So I I think that's a good time. Now, uh, you know, there, there might be plenty of people that disagree. If that's the only time you're surveying, hmm, probably you may want to pick, you know, a different time. There's certainly, you know, customers that might say, hey, I haven't even gotten to your product. Like, I, I don't know, you know, um, that type of thing. But I think it's interesting to note, um, you know, if the satisfaction of your customer at the end of onboarding was very high and their ongoing NPS, right, their NPS after six months um, or their, their recurring NPS maybe after two years is low, you know, what are we doing in onboarding that is, that is so good? Uh, what are we doing throughout the mid-life cycle or end-life cycle that 
you know, can be deterring our customers from, from being satisfied. Uh, maybe it's the other way around. They're super unhappy after onboarding because it's taken them forever. They've had to do all these technical things and they haven't been able to get into the system. And then after it's happy, just think of these as data points. So every data point can be useful as long as we have the information around it to provide context. Got it. Um, our next question is, um, do you have any suggestions for engaging with clients that might have inherited your product or weren't around when you went through the initial onboarding? Should they go through the onboarding process themselves? Yeah, so I guess I'll put that out to, to the group, right? Um, if you're a brand new person, being introduced to a product that's already embedded in a company. Would you want to be introduced to the product? How would you want that to happen? For me, I think I would want to be introduced to the product, um, whether that is the responsibility of me as the, you know, as the person who has purchased the product or as, you know, as the person who is delivering the product or service. Uh, that I think is the point of contention. But I think at any point, if that is a key critical user, if it's an admin user versus an end user, you know, they might want to be treated in different ways. But I think that there are certainly ways within the technology stack that you have, uh, perhaps, or the services that you provide that can still, you know, provide some level of guidance there. Even if it's, hey, welcome, we know that you're a brand new user. Here are some three, you know, here are three resources that we think you know, you'll find useful. Um, even that, I would be so excited. I just signed on to a different, um, you know, a different business technology the other day, and I got this super short, relevant email that said, hey, you're new, look at these three things to get started. Yeah, I'm going to look at that because I have no idea what I'm supposed to be doing, right? Um, so I, I think we're just at time here, and I want to be um, just aware of everybody's time. So I appreciate everybody joining us today, um, and I'll let Corey wrap it up. Yeah, thank you so much, Bora. I think we got to as many questions as we can, um, but we are happy to follow up individually. Um, so I just want to remind everyone that we are recording this webinar and we will be sending out a link to the recording tomorrow afternoon. Um, and a survey will pop up at the end and we'd appreciate it if you could just take a minute before logging off to complete your survey to provide your feedback. And thanks again, everyone, for joining us and have a great rest of your day. Thanks, Bora.